We just got the finale for Adventure Time Fiona and Cake, and while it wrapped things up pretty nicely, there were a few things I see a lot of people talking about as being confusing, so we're gonna break down what we can, but spoilers ahead if you haven't seen it. Now, for those who aren't remembering, Fiona and Cake were originally fanfiction characters written by the Ice King as Benergent versions of Jake and Finn. However, we learned in this show that they were from a real dimension created by the Wishmaster Prismo, and hidden inside of Simon's head. Simon's head is so complicated, particularly as the Ice King, that the whole dimension can fit in there, and his ice crown was able to supply the magic that the dimension thrived off of. In the original finale for Adventure Time, however, Simon lost his crown and reverted to his human state, turning Fiona and Cake's world into one without magic, and with no one having any memory of their more fantasy-based existence. The series opened with Simon being tired of his life without Betty in the future of Ooh, and trying to use some magic to go and see her as Gulb, but in doing so, he accidentally created a portal in his head that let Fiona and Cake out. The three end up going on adventures across the multiverse, where we visit different dimensions from the original series, as well as entirely new ones, showing different versions of Ooh and the Ice King. All of this was building to this two-part finale, when Simon uses the power of a lich in an abandoned dimension and opens a portal for Fiona and Cake to return to their own world while he puts on the Ice Crown. The previous episode ended with a portal opening beneath Simon before he puts the crown on and him falling into it. So what exactly happened from here? It's important to remember that in the original Adventure Time finale, Betty used the crown's magic to wish that she could protect Simon no matter what. The biggest threat to him at the time was Golb, a being of chaos that wants to destroy reality. The crown magic merges Betty with Golb, allowing her to return to the chaos of nothingness, keeping Simon and all of Ooh safe. In part one of this two-part finale, Simon wakes up in the void of Golb with the portal in his head still working and the crown nearby. Simon is here with the Lich, who does not recognize Golb as Betty, but instead speaks of all the things he has done in Golb's honor to wipe out life, and yet still feels purposeless. This results in Golb Betty turning the Lich into one of the many floating puzzle pieces that surround her, but not Simon. Simon monologues about how he has purpose now thanks to Fiona and Cake, and due to him learning to love again through them, he accepts that he must put on the Ice Crown to protect them. However, Betty's wish was to protect Simon no matter what, and what she had set out to protect Simon from when she first summoned Golb was the madness of the crown and Simon's fate as the Ice King. With that in mind, despite Simon thinking he is happy to accept that fate, Betty seems to be unable to stop herself at all from interfering even if she wanted to, as her wish in many ways is more powerful than what she is now as Golb. To stop Simon from making this mistake with the crown, he is instead teleported into the mind of Shermie, who you will remember as a sort of parallel to Finn deep in Ooze's future, who Bimo told the story of Adventure Time's finale to in the original series. This is not an alternate timeline, as Simon first thinks when he enters Shermie's body, but our original Ooze's future, which I think could seriously be explored in its own miniseries in the near future. Since this is the future, the crown of this dimension was already changed, first to turn Betty into Golb, and then after resetting again, it turned Gunther into a caricature of the Ice King, though he seemingly had no powers and just had this crazy twisted form, meaning that crown would be of no use to Simon. Regardless, Simon thinks that a library might have some answers on where this new dimension's crown might be, and tags along with Beth to check out a futuristic sci-fi book that is more of a choose-your-own-adventure game. Now, Simon believes that this is an alternate dimension, as I said, and this book was written by Simon, so he thinks it will lead him to the actual crown of the supposed alternate reality. But what he doesn't realize is that this was a book that he is going to make later in his life when he travels back to the past. Through experiencing this here in this episode, he will later return to his own body and create this game for his past self to find in Shermie's body. While expecting answers for the crown, he instead, of course, found deeper understandings of his relationship with Betty, and how choices he made got them to where they were that day. Now, the great tragedy of this video game is that Simon is able to understand the dynamic between its characters now that his own past and his love for Betty aren't clouding his judgment with his personal attachment. In this game, his basic story is told with Casper, who represents the night, and Nova, who represents the day, with there always being two options the player can choose, one that leans towards Nova's goals and one that leans towards Casper's. 
Now, Casper and Nova are in love, but Casper, representing Betty, also has an obsessive part of her feelings. Her love for Simon was such that she would abandon her own goals to help Simon pursue his. Simon, wanting that crown, instinctively chose the options of Nova every single time, leading to a dead end with two very bad options where he can't get the crown and also live happily ever after. Beth teaches Simon that if he had made some choices for Casper instead of himself, they may have found an alternate story where they still got the crown, but everyone was happy. Simon then realizes that Betty was ascended to the most insane levels of existence because of her obsession with Simon, with her final wish being to protect Simon no matter what. Her fate as Gold mirrors her life as Betty, with everything she does being to help and support him at the expense of herself. And that's how she ended up fused with the essence of chaos and non-existence, a god who consumes the souls of those who cannot rise higher, or else sends them back to the realm of existence. When Simon returns to his body with Golbetti, he realizes that things could have been so different if he just went with Betty on her mission that day on the bus instead of pulling her along to his. Despite all of these realizations, he still wants to put the crown on, however, when he gets a call from Fiona explaining that her world is being attacked. He feels he has no choice, and now hates that he has to do this, but he is willing to for a moment. In the end, however, he rejects the crown, and instead, perhaps to protect him from doing this again, Betty is able to make Fiona and Cake's dimension canon by making Simon cough up some sort of soul for that dimension, that he then inserts back into the dimension through the portal in his head. This magic item becomes a dandelion, which allows Fiona to make a wish and blow the seeds into the air. Each person gets one, and each of them collectively holds the dimension inside of them, which allows the dimension to become canon and exist outside of Simon's head. It's okay, I didn't really get this either. Now in the end, Fiona's world became canon, but it didn't become magic again or have its history rewritten, something she had grown opposed to over the course of the show. Fiona saw the magical worlds as exhausting, but I feel like if she let magic return, she knows she'd become a more efficient human like Finn who can handle magic worlds just fine. However, after returning to her world, she also learned that Marshall and Gary are in a relationship now, and they are all afraid that that can be erased too. So they get to be a legit reality that lasts forever, but live in a world without magic so they can retain their current identities. Fiona now has an appreciation for the simple things in life, not wanting a huge adventure, and instead is just enjoying her time with the people around her who she already loved. This has answered a lot of questions on Adventure Time's lore, and if you'd like a giant lore video this coming week about the real life history that inspires the lore of Adventure Time and Fiona and Cake, let me know in the comments down below, and don't forget to subscribe because I'd have a lot of fun making that. As far as the future of the franchise goes, I'm really hopeful. I'm the kind of person who has a lot of cartoons that I don't really dislike by any means, but that I never really got into. Adventure Time was exactly that kind of show, and I was more interested in its bigger picture stuff that I'd see online than in the episode by episode adventures. However, Fiona and Cake really resonated with me in particular and has given me a new appreciation for the original series, making the parts I did love just hit that much harder on rewatches, and the parts that I didn't really care for before now having so much more meaning. As of now, I feel like Adventure Time could continue as a very long-running franchise. Its original world is so wild and wacky, and anything could happen in it, and with the multiverse wide open, it could become a brand just exploring the endless possibilities of strange spiritual concepts with bright and colorful cartoon characters in different versions of our Earth. Fiona and Cake allowed Adventure Time to really grow up with its audience, and if the numbers do well, I would love to see a new series every year just focusing on a new dimension, new characters, and reusing what they can of the original Adventure Time while creating endless new places to explore in this mini-series format, as it's very strong. And who wouldn't love more spiritually focused cartoons like this? But what do you guys think? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below, and I'll see you next time.